Hey everybody, welcome to a brand new series that I'm calling The Games That Shaped Me. This is very unique um, because this is, uh, as of right now, the only new thing I'm adding in 2022 to the Turbo Zone lineup. Uh, oh, this will be running alongside uh, continuing series like my normal reviews, uh, the all new Turbo Show, Alex and Spencer, Turbo Vlogs, Table of Ranking and shitty reviews, so on and so forth. Um, now what this series is, is a look back at the games that I've played throughout my life. Uh, recently I did a thing, uh, a response, um, that I was tagged in through Teddy from Majority, and I think it started with VG Mashup or somebody, um, where they asked what my top 10 games of all time were, and I had to give that list. It was a very, very tough list to, to make because uh, I've played a lot of games. You know, it's it's hard when, you, when you're when you a gamer like I am, you know, when you play a lot of video games, it's hard just to pick 10 uh, because you tend to, uh, and, you know, unless you're somebody that sticks with, with one game for a long time or you don't have you know, money to buy new games, you tend to uh, try different games out and different things shape the, you know, what you like and what you don't like. Um... And with the games that shaped me, not only is it the games that are good that were important, it's also, it's also the games that were bad that was important that I want to talk about. So, that's what the series is. It's sort of like a semi-review, semi-podcast. I'm not sure exactly what you would call that. Uh, but if you're interested in listening to this in the podcast format, um, this will also be up on Spotify. I will put a link to that in the description or something. Um... I haven't done that yet because obviously I'm recording the first episode and I have to have the first episode ready to put up on Spotify. So I'm still working at the kinks there. Um, if you're interested in hearing other stuff from me, if you're either a subscriber of TurboZone or if you just happen upon this because you like Kirby or if you like, you know, whatever. Um, I do a, a two other podcasts. I do the Button Mappers uh, with uh, Majority and RPG Archive, Teddy and Spencer. Um, that is on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Uh, and I do Turbo Dojo, which is the official Turbo Zone podcast that I do with my best friend Damon. It is on YouTube and Spotify. So let's uh, let's jump into this. Um, <laughs> I'm getting a, sorry. I'm getting a YouTube update from it says I got a um, a comment from Terry three oh nine. I haven't checked my comments in a minute. Alright, um, Kirby's Star Stacker is an interesting game for me to start with with this series. Um, because it's not a game that I hear people talk about too often. Um, now, Kirby is not in my top ten, like, series of all time or anything. Um, it's, it's nowhere up there. I do like Kirby a lot. Uh, my favorite main series Kirby game is uh, Dreamland 3, but I, I've played a lot of the games. Um, you know, I grew up playing the original Dreamland on Game Boy. Um, I played 64. I'm not a huge fan of 64, but I, I played 64 growing up. You know, I, I had Air Ride on the GameCube. I, I still have it, but, you know, I had it when it was s semi-relevant. Um, so, you know, Kirby's always been a fixture in my life. I, I, I like Kirby. I have, you know, some Kirby collectibles and stuff. Um, now, when I was younger, though... The first console I ever had was the Sega Game Gear. I'll talk about that some other time. But, um, I'm not sure which Christmas it was, like what what year it was, but one Christmas when I was a young boy, a young lad, I got a green Game Boy Color. Big deal when you're a kid to get a Game Boy or Game Boy Color. I didn't, like I said, I didn't have a Game Boy. I had a Game Gear, which suited me well. I'm a huge Sega fan, but... Uh, the Game Boy is a phenomenal platform, and I got it with a few games. I think I got, like, The Emperor's New Groove, um, Cubert, and Pokemon Motherfucking Gold. Because um, I was super in, I was super into Pokemon. It's funny, I actually watched the anime and collected the cards and stuff and played Stadium before I ever played a main series title. So, that was my, uh, you know, first time experiencing Pokemon. But, after getting the Game Boy Color, the, I would play the Game Boy a ton, and it would be the console that I would get a lot of games for. I also had a 64 and a PS1, but, um, you know, there's just something great when you're a kid about being able to play a handheld console 
like and still be around your family when when you're playing like a 64 or a PS1 or something at that time you know and like and, and, and unless you're sitting in the living room and your family watches you play or something like it's sort of an antisocial um thing to do you know you're kind of locked away in your room playing by yourself or something unless you're playing multiplayer so the game boy was great because i could be out with my family in whatever room they're in you know the living room outside in the car you know whatever we're doing at grandma's house but i could still be playing my video games and the game boy was a great uh the way for me to do that um I got those three games, but that's not the only games I had on Game Boy. Um, I had a lot of other games that shaped me for good or bad. Uh, you know, some of the good ones being like Donkey Kong Land, Mario Land 2, the original Kirby's Dream Land. A, a lot of lands. There's, there's a lot of lands in the Game Boy, it seems like. Um, and some of the ones that shit me for the worse. Um, maybe the Game Boy port of Mortal Kombat? Jesus. Um, I, would, I would mainly get these games at at yard sales, flea markets. We weren't very uh, well off when I was growing up, um, which is something that surprises a lot of people, especially when I got to like high school because I had a lot of video games at that point and that was just me like never getting rid of anything. And uh, there was like, you're spoiled. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's like actually we're pretty poor. I just keep everything that I get. Um, so one of the games that I got one day, I don't know if it was at a yard sale, I don't know if it was at a flea market, which, if you know what a flea market is, it's basically just a hillbilly yard sale. <laughs> just a bunch of bunch of hillbillies all together selling shit. Um, you know, you can go there and buy knockoff products and, and food and, you know, whatever else. And usually, back then, you can get reasonable deals on games. So now, they try to scalp you. I went to a, yard, uh, a flea market um, back in 2016... And dude tried to sell me a copy of Mario Bros. Duck Hunt for like fucking like 20 bucks or something. It was something stupid. I was like, this is not worth $20. Uh, I had just gotten the Retron 5, so I had started collecting some more NES games. And of course, that was one of the first ones I wanted to get. Um, <laughs> I didn't buy it from him, though, because once again, he was trying to rip me off. So, back then, though, you can get some reasonable deals for old old games, because people didn't know, you know, there was no internet, really, and people didn't know the value. Um, so, one day, I got Kirby's Star Stacker. Now, Kirby's Star Stacker is notable because it's my first real puzzle game. Um, I think I had played a couple on the Game Gear, but I was so young at that point, it was hard for me to, like, really grasp the, the concepts. Like, I played, I think it was... One of the bust and move slash you know puzzle bobble games on Game Gear, and I, I know I had Lemmings, but again I don't think I was like old enough to really understand the concepts. I liked playing them, but I don't think I was very good at them. Kirby Star Stacker is a great beginner's puzzle game. Um, it's a pretty simple concept. If you played the Kirby's Dreamland games, especially Dreamland Two and Three, uh, Kirby has these animal friends. So the concept of the game is that you have two different types of blocks. You have the animal blocks and the star blocks. Now, the animal blocks are what you're actually matching. You just need to match two of them. Um, but putting them side by side isn't what you want to do. Um, for each level, you have a certain amount of star blocks you want to clear. It tells you um, on the side panel. And what you want to do is link as many of those like uh, star blocks uh, between any two... Uh, of the you know matching animals to uh, clear a line of, of stars and that you know uh, reduces your star count. It's kind of hard to explain but it's pretty simple. Um, the first few difficulties are very easy, very easy and to, uh, like I think easy difficulty even like sometimes it just tells you straight up like put the block here. Um, what's cool is that if you get two matches in a row, it starts this chain reaction where Kirby will start throwing stars down onto the play field and start helping you clear out the board. So ideally, most of the puzzles, you can, if you know what you're doing, you can clear them out in just a couple moves through that combo mechanic. It's very neat. Um, the game gets much harder though when you get into the hard and very hard difficulties. That's where I like to play now uh, because I've, I've had a lot of experience playing this game. But um, when you're a kid, though, you know, having the easier difficulties really helped me to grasp the idea of a puzzle game. Again, I didn't play a lot of puzzle games at this point. So 
this was really the first of its kind, and I remember playing this game for hours. I remember, like, vacations and car rides and stuff where I was just playing Kirby's Star Stacker. And again, at this point, I had played Dreamland 1, but Kirby wasn't, like, some, you know, he wasn't a, a part of my, my regular, you know, gaming habits. It wasn't like I loved the Kirby franchise. So, the fact that this game stuck with me for this long... Uh, you know, despite me not really caring about Kirby at the time, um, says a lot about how well the game's mechanics really work. Um, I'm on the Wikipedia page because I do want to give some fun facts. Um, and apparently there was a remake of this on the Super Famicom. Um, only released on the Super Famicom, though. Which, damn, that's cool. <laughs> um... I need to see if, like, I have a, again, I have a Retron 5, so I can play Super Famicom titles. I need to see if I could track down a copy of that to add to my Super Famicom library, uh, because that's, that's pretty cool. Um, Kirby Star Stacker, and the Japanese title, um, <laughs> the Japanese title translates to Kirby's Sparkling Kids. Kirby Sparkling Kid, what, that, that's a, that name just rolls, I'm, I'm, I'm glad they changed it to Star Stacker, Star Stacker sounds a lot better. Um, blah blah blah, game modes, yeah, it has a round clear mode, has a versus mode, has a challenge mode, which is more like, you know, like an endless mode you play in Tetris or something, or, and it has a time attack mode, um, which is, you need to eliminate as many stars as you can in three minutes. Um, pretty puzzle game, you know, like, pretty well fleshed out puzzle game. Um, when you're playing a puzzle game um, on the Game Boy, you kind of want a little bit of variety. Um, but you know, I've I, I I didn't have that like Tetris experience. I know I know a lot of people played Tetris on the original Game Boy, um, and I think this was my like my replacement Tetris uh, because on the Game Boy, like you could you could play puzzle games for just fucking hours, like. They're infinitely replayable, um, and I've I've since played other puzzle games on the Game Boy. Um, more recently, I was playing uh, Pack Attack and uh, Tetris Attack, two attack games, weirdly enough. Um, and you know, like I, they're just fun games, even though the Game Boy versions aren't like as good as other versions. They're just fun on the Game Boy. I don't know, just some about the portable nature, the primitive graphics, and how simple the games are. They're just so much fun. Um, now, Kirby Star Stacker is notable for me, again, because it got me into puzzle games. Uh, and I like this game a lot. It stuck with me. It's a game, it's the Kirby game on the Game Boy, not counting uh, Dreamland 1 and 2, but of the spin off games uh, like Block Ball and uh, Pinball Land and stuff. Uh, I think Kirby Star Stacker is the best out of these Kirby Game Boy spin offs, or just Kirby spin offs in general. I mean,. Uh, there, are, there are some pretty good Kirby spinoffs. What's funny is that later on, on the Super Nintendo, they would release uh, Kirby's Avalanche, which is a conversion of Puyo Puyo, which is strange to me uh, because Kirby's Star Stacker exists, and they did a remake on the on the Super Famicom. Um, it seemed like they wanted, could have wanted to st uh, like stick to the the originality. The, that Star Stacker had within the Kirby franchise. So that's strange. What's also strange is that I never played Avalanche until, like, until recently. Um, but I played Dr. Robotin's Mean Bean Machine a ton on this on the Sega Genesis. And through that game, which is basically the same thing as Avalanche, just reskinned with uh, Sonic. Um, through that game, Puyo Puyo became my all-time favorite puzzle game. So even though, like... I didn't play Kirby's Avalanche. Kirby is still somehow linked with my all-time favorite puzzle game, Puyo Puyo. Um, not, <laughs> and that has nothing to do with uh, Star Stacker. I just think that's bizarre. Uh, my first puzzle game was a Kirby game, and Kirby is linked to my favorite puzzle game. So that's a weird um, chain of coincidences. Um, you know. Uh, other than that, there's really not a lot to say on the Wikipedia page for this game. Wow. Um, I wonder if it has any reviews. Kirby, let's see, let's look up Kirby's Star Stacker Reviews. See what people thought of it. 
Nintendo Life. Uh, see if I can find anybody from like a long time ago. A long time ago. No, I'm, I'm only gonna find like reset stuff. Um. Uh, that kind of sucks. I wish I had like a way to look up old magazine reviews. I'm, I'm sure I can. I just, I just don't, don't do that often. Um, oh shit! I forgot Kirby's Tilt and Tumble was also in Game Boy. I didn't play that. <laughs> I wonder if that's good. Let me know in the comments if uh, Kirby's Tilt and Tumble is any good. Um, but yeah, that's my history with Star Stacker. Uh, pretty. I, I, a pretty simple game to open the episode with, uh, you know, o open the series with, with the first episode, with Star Stacker, because I wanted to give this a test run and see what you guys think, and I wanted to talk about a game that maybe I haven't talked about. If you're watching the YouTube upload, I do have gameplay, and I will try to have gameplay for all of the games. Uh, if you're listening to this on Spotify, uh, you're just looking at whatever dumb logo I've created for this series. So, uh, just imagine, just imagine a baby puke green Game Boy screen. Cl close your eyes with me. Baby puke green Game Boy screen. And Kirby is on the side of the, the, the puzzle thing dancing while you drop the blocks. And DDD is up top and as you get closer and closer to finishing the level, DDD gets more worried. His facial expressions get more and more worried. But if you start to lose, he becomes very happy. Um, and that's the game. <laughs> there you go. Visual representation through audio format. Uh, I should start reading books on tape for this show. And Kirby stepped into the whatever. I don't know. I can't think of any uh, funny book references offhand. I'm not a big book buff. <laughs> um, this version was released. Oh, never mind. Well, fuck. Why did the Super Famicom version never come out over here? Like, even later on, it only got a Wii Virtual Console re-release in Japan. They would bring. They would go through the trouble of localizing. Sin and Punishment for the 64 to play on the Wii's Virtual Console. Which, by the way, as much as I love Sin and Punishment, that's a, another series I will have to do an episode on or something. The Wii Virtual Console version of, of, of Sin and Punishment, playing with a Pro Controller or Game Controller, plays like dog shit. It's made for a 64 controller. So the fact that they went through the trouble to localize Sin and Punishment and not... The, the Super Famicom version of Kirby Star Stacker makes me very upset. <laughs> because I could have been playing this on my Wii! <laughs> Dang it, Reggie! Why'd you do this to me, man? Um, anyway, I guess that was the show for today. Uh, thanks for listening to me ramble. If you like hearing me ramble, um, be sure to let me know what you think of the series. Any improvements you would give me? Any advice you would give me to make improvements, I mean? Um, you know, good. what's your favorite Kirby game? Who's your favorite Kirby character? That's the that's the more important question. And why is it Gooey? Why is Gooey the best Kirby character? And if you don't know who Gooey is, go, go educate yourself on the uh, history of Gooey. I'm gonna get off here. I'm tired. <laughs> uh, Kirby, Kirby, uh, what's this called? Kirby Star Stacker, everybody. I forgot the name of the game for a second. It's Kirby St Star Stacker. I'm getting old.